This is problem set 27, where we're going to take our knowledge about intermolecular forces and apply it to <clears throat> a bunch of different properties of molecules. This is kind of where chemistry um, becomes, in my opinion, cool, because we can start using what we understand about chemistry to explain um, phenomena that we see in the real world at a macroscopic scale. So let's start by talking electrostatic forces are involved in holding together ionic compounds, molecules, crystal lattices, all of the above are only A and C. Well, what are electrostatic forces? Electrostatic forces are just charged things being attracted. So in ionic compounds, right, that's just a positive ion and a negative ion being attracted. So that's electrostatic forces. Molecules, what holds molecules together? Well, I've got, let's say this is one atom, this is another atom. Well, I've got my nucleuses attracted to my electrons. I've got my electrons attracted to the other protons. Anyway, all of that is just charged particles. Okay, and then crystal lattices, that's exactly the same as ionic compounds. Ionic compounds form crystal lattices, so all of the above. So if we're talking about chemistry, and whether we're talking about bonds or intermolecular forces, I've got my intermolecular force table here from problem set 26 video. Um, all of this is, is electrostatic forces. That's what governs all of this. All right, for the following compounds, uh, pairs of compounds determine which compound will the high, have the highest value of boiling point, surface tension, viscosity, and volatility. All right, so this is where we're getting into some properties of molecules. Um, and <coughs> when we see questions like this, really these are questions about intermolecular forces. So let's take a minute and talk about how each of these, <coughs> each of these properties um, relates to intermolecular forces. So boiling point, <coughs> let's think if I have stronger intermolecular forces, what um, is going to happen to my boiling point? Well, well, stronger intermolecular forces means that um, all of my molecules within my liquid are holding on to each other tighter, and so it's going to be harder for those molecules to break out into the gas phase to boil. So stronger intermolecular forces is going to mean that you need to put in more energy to boil so you'll have a higher boiling point temperature. Okay, what about surface tension? Surface tension is <coughs> the idea that at the surface of, let's say, water, you've got all your water molecules. Right, and you could take like a needle or like a paper clip and you can actually balance it or float it on the water even though the paperclip is denser than water and should sink. <clears throat> and sure enough, if you push it under the water a little bit, the, the paperclip will sink. Well, what's holding that paperclip up is surface tension. The idea that these individual molecules have forces holding them together and the paperclip is not heavy enough to break that surface tension. So if my forces, my intermolecular forces go up, my surface tension is likewise going to go up. All right, viscosity. What is viscosity? Viscosity is resistance to flow. So if you think honey or molasses, those we usually think of them as like thick. Okay, that means that they are resisting flow. They're more viscous. Okay, and so molecules that have stronger intermolecular forces are going to have more resistance to flow because if I have this molecule trying to push past that molecule, it's a lot harder than if I have that molecule trying to push past that molecule. Does that make sense? So more intermolecular forces means it's going to be harder for molecules to slide past each other, which is going to make it more viscous. And volatile, or volatility. So volatility is, <coughs> volatility is the tendency of a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is the tendency of um, a molecule in the liquid phase, so I've got all my liquid molecules, they're all moving around and stuff. Every once in a while, you can get one that's moving fast enough to break into the gas phase. Okay, that's volatility. Um, so if you think of like a puddle on the street, puddles on the street evaporate, they eventually go away, right? They're not boiling away, okay? They're just volatile enough that slowly liquid molecules break into the gas phase until the puddle's all gone. So if you think if I have stronger intermolecular forces, these molecules are going to be held in tighter, which means this breakaway is going to happen less, which means it will be less volatile. All right, so we've now related all of these properties 
to, to intermolecular forces. So really, this question becomes not a question about boiling point, surface tension, viscosity, or volatility. It becomes a question about intermolecular forces. So my next step would be to look at look at ethane and say, all right, if I have a bunch of ethane, what's the dominant intermolecular force? Well, ethane, is it ionic or covalent? It's covalent because it's just carbons and hydrogens. Um, it can't be that because I only have one type of molecule, ethane. There's no OH, FH, or NH in it. I have to ask, is ethane, so ethane looks like this. Uh, no, it looks like that, it's just a line. C2H6. Um, and if it's just carbons and hydrogens, it's going to be a nonpolar molecule. And so that means ethane has just London dispersion as the strongest intermolecular force. Hey, what about ethanol? You should be able to look at that real quick, but going through the process, um, it's a covalent compound. It can't be that guy because there's only one molecule and there are OHs. So this is going to have hydrogen bonding. So ethanol has stronger intermolecular forces. As a result, stronger intermolecular force means this is going to have a stronger boiling point. So A, it's going to have a stronger surface tension. B, it's going to have stronger viscosity. C, and it's going to have weaker volatility, which means ethane is going to have stronger volatility. Okay, so now ethanol and ethanethyl. So I'm going to go through these intermolecular force um, designations pretty quick. So I see eth ethanol has that OH, which means it's I know it's going to have hydrogen bonding. Ethanethyl is all carbons and hydrogens except for this S here, this SH thing. Well, that's going to throw off. It kind of looks like this. Looks like that. Okay, that's going to throw off the balance. So this all of a sudden becomes polar. And so this is going to be dipole, dipole. Well, which is stronger, hydrogen bonding or dipole, dipole? If we look at my chart, hydrogen bonding is stronger than dipole, dipole. Okay, and so as a result, eth ethanol is going to be stronger in boiling point surface tension and viscosity, and ethanethyl is going to be stronger in volatility. All right, diethyl ether and 1-butanol, they're structural isomers, and they're both C4H10O. But if we look at this one, it's all carbons and hydrogens. That hydrogen should be up, um, except it's got this oxygen, this oxygen in the middle, which is going to throw off the balance. Now, you might think that looks balanced, but remember, this oxygen has lone pairs on it, that are actually going to make the geometry around that oxygen bent. So this would be a better image of it, and that's not a balanced molecule. As a result, this is going to be dipole, dipole. Um, butanol, however, has this OH. So even though it will have this whole nonpolar side, it will have hydrogen bonding in it. So because this is stronger, this is going to be better boiling point, surface tension, and viscosity, and this is going to be better volatility. So hopefully you see this is really just a question about intermolecular forces, and we're going to see that same pattern throughout this entire problem set. Okay. All right, number three. Compounds with low boiling points may be sprayed on the skin as a topical anesthetic. They chill the skin as they evaporate and provide short-term relief from injuries. You might have seen this in, um, like, uh, soccer. I think I see it a lot in soccer. Um, people twist their ankles or something, and so they, they spray them with... <clears throat> I don't know what they use, but you could use like liquid oxygen, right? If you spray liquid oxygen on there, the, the oxygen molecules are going to evaporate as soon as they hit your skin. Okay, but to evaporate, they need to suck in heat, and they're going to suck heat in from your skin, um, which is going to make your skin really cold. And so, anyway, predict which compound below has the lowest boiling point. Okay, so, and I don't know if they use oxygen. Oxygen might be really cold and actually burn your skin, but anyway. Which is the lowest boiling point? So, lowest boiling point. Remember, boiling point goes up with intermolecular forces. So, lowest boiling point, this is really a question about lowest intermolecular forces. So, let's designate what intermolecular forces each of these has. So, this molecule, they're all covalent, right? Because if we're drawing Lewis structures of them, they're covalent. Um, so, this is all balanced except that chlorine, which is going to make it polar. So, this is going to be dipole, dipole. This has an OH on it, so that's going to be hydrogen bonding. 
This also has an OH on it, so that's going to be hydrogen bonding. And this has two o OHs on it, um, so that's going to be hydrogen bonding. All right, so three of these have hydrogen bonding. The other one is just dipole-dipole, so this one is going to be the lowest boiling point. Does it say to... Yeah, that's all it wants. Okay. Rank the... Well, let's just take a minute and talk about on this one how we would rank if we wanted to find rank highest to lowest because um, this is a good exercise in that. So we know this is lowest. Um, these all have hydrogen bonding, so how would I differentiate them? The first thing to look at is how many OH groups does it have? This has one, this has one, and this has two. So this is going to have the strongest hydrogen bonding. So this would be the highest. Okay, we know that's the lowest. <clears throat> then these two both have one area of hydrogen bonding. So their hydrogen bonding you can think of as essentially equivalent. Well, what do they both also have? They both also have London dispersion. And so then I would say, well, which has more London dispersion? That's based on how big the molecule is. This molecule is a lot bigger than this guy. And so this would be two and this would be three. All right, rank the compounds in each set in order of increasing boiling point. So in order of increasing intermolecular forces. So let's see. We've got CCL4. I'm just going to draw them all. CF4 and CH4. So I have to ask myself, what are the types of intermolecular forces each of these feel? Well, if you look, they're all tet tetrahedral with identical molecules around the outside. These are all balanced, and so they're all London dispersion. So then I have to ask myself, well, what makes London dispersion stronger? London dispersion is stronger when you have a bigger molecule, and if their size is the same, then you want a flatter molecule. Well, I look at these. Okay, I know chlorine atoms are larger. They have more electrons and more protons, and therefore this CCL4 is going to be the biggest. Okay, and it, because it's the biggest, it's going to have the strongest intermolecular forces, and so this is going to be, um, they want increasing intermolecular forces. So I'm going to make that 3 because it's the highest. So we're increasing 1, 2, and 3. Well, then what's next biggest? Uh, CF4 would be the next biggest, so it's going to be 2, and CH4 is going to be 1. All right, NH3... CH4 and SIH4. All right, what types of intermolecular forces? Well, these are both going to be nonpolar. These are both going to be London dispersion. This guy, however, has is a polar molecule, but it has those NH bonds. Remember, hydrogen bonding has FH, OH, or NH. It's got those NH bonds, and so as a result, this is going to be hydrogen bonding. So that's automatically going to make it the highest. And now I have to look at these two and say between these two, they're both London dispersion, so which one's bigger? SiH4 is bigger, so that's going to be better. So CH4, SiH4, NH3. And lastly, we've got I2, ICL, and um, Br2. Okay, so what type of intermolecular forces do they feel? Um, this is a just a nonpolar bond, and since it's just a small molecule like that, this is a nonpolar molecule, so this is going to be London dispersion. This is also London dispersion and ICL. Those have electronegativity difference of, I think, about 0.5, which is going to make this a polar molecule, and therefore its intermolecular forces will be dipole-dipole. So you would think that we would rank this strongest, and then... Um, iodine is bigger than bromine, and so it's going to be next, and bromine is going to be the worst. Okay, but that's actually not the case for reasons that we don't expect you to just know off the top of your head. Um, so really, this is dipole-dipole, um, but it's not the strongest because Br2 is actually quite a bit bigger than, hold on, Sorry, I2 is actually quite a bit bigger than ICL is. And so even though um, 
This is dipole-dipole. The London dispersion in I2 is stronger than the dipole-dipole in ICL. And so as a result, we're actually flip those. Um, this is 2 and this is 3. But again, that's not something we would expect. Those first answers that I put is what we, we would expect you to say um, 1, 2, 3, I think. Um, but in reality, it's that's not the case. Okay. Cool. So again, these are really just questions about intermolecular forces. And we're going to keep going. Um, predict which liquid has the fall in the following sets have the greatest surface tension. What does that mean? Surface tension goes up with intermolecular forces. So which has the greatest intermolecular forces? Okay. Well, they're both carbons and hydrogen, so they're both going to be London dispersion. And London dispersion cares about how big you are. Well, this guy has eight carbons. This has six, so this is going to um, have stronger intermolecular forces and therefore greater surface tension. I'm going to draw these out for you. Ethanol looks like this. Acetic acid looks like this. Okay, so we can see both of them have hydrogen bonding because um, that OH molecule. Um, so then we would, there's a couple ways to think about it. Um, you could think, well, if I had another acetic acid, I could actually hydrogen bond in two areas. Okay, because you need an OH in one molecule and just an O in the other. Uh, so you could think of it that way. Or you could just think of, well, this is a lot bigger. So if they have the same hydrogen bonding, bigger is better because then we look at London dispersion. And so acetic acid wins out there. Okay. So which of the following substances will be soluble in water? So this might be something we haven't talked about yet. Things dissolve. Soluble means they dissolve. Things dissolve in other things that have similar intermolecular forces. So in general, if you've got polar, it's going to dissolve in polar, and nonpolar is going to dissolve in nonpolar. Um, ionic, right? Ionic is stronger. And so ions can dissolve in polar things. But if you have weaker ions in terms of lattice energy, weaker lattice energy ions, those are going to dissolve better because um, they're closer to the forces that that are felt in dipole dipole. So anyway, so really what this is asking, which we soluble in water, it's really asking which are polar or which experience dipole dipole or hydrogen bonding, which will be soluble in nonpolar, well, which ones experience London dispersion. So, so gasoline, um, so I'm going to just, I'm going to color code this. Water is going to be red and nonpolar is going to be, um, black. So gasoline, gasoline is just carbons and hydrogens. So it's going to be nonpolar. Crayons are also long hydrocarbons. That's why they're waxy. Vinegar has acetic acid in it, which is this guy. Okay. And so that has hydrogen bonding going on. So it's going to dissolve in water. NaCl is ionic. So it may dissolve in water. A lot, it'll definitely dissolve in water better than it dissolves in um, a nonpolar solvent. Okay. SO2 SO2 is going to dissolve in water. CS2 is, um, let's talk about, uh, let's talk real quick about SO2. So SO2 looks like this. All right, so that's a bent molecule and that's why it's polar. CS2 on the other hand looks like this. That's linear, so it's nonpolar. So that's going to dissolve in nonpolar solvents. And lastly, CaOH2, that's an ionic compound. And therefore, that's more likely to dissolve in a uh, polar solvent like water. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. Yep. Okay. All right. So similar intermolecular forces dissolve in each other. That's the moral of that story. All right, the boiling point of O2 is negative 183 degrees Celsius. The boiling point of N2 is negative 195 degrees Celsius. So then I asked to briefly explain why the boiling point of oxygen is higher than that of nitrogen. Okay, we should be able to figure out from those boiling points which has stronger intermolecular forces. We know stronger intermolecular forces means stronger boiling point, higher boiling point. Well, which of these has a higher boiling point? Oxygen. It's a lower number, but they're negative, right? So it's actually higher. Um, so oxygen has stronger intermolecular forces than nitrogen. Explain why that's the case. 
So, so what type of intermolecular forces do they feel? Right, so O2 looks like this, N2 looks like this. Okay, they're both just going to be nonpolar molecules. So they're both London dispersion, and London dispersion is better when you have more electrons, more protons, kind of bigger, uh, more massive molecules. And so since O2 has a bigger molar mass, and it's got more electrons, that's why it has more London dispersion. That's a good way of putting it. All right, describe how O2 and N2 could be separated on the basis of their boiling points, allowing us to have pure O2 to make a solid O2 rocket or pure N2 to make liquid nitrogen ice cream. Okay, so let's say we've got a mixture. It's got oxygen and it's got nitrogen. We know oxygen boils at negative 183 degrees Celsius. Nitrogen boils at negative uh, 195 degrees Celsius. So what they're getting at here is what if we, um, what if we had the mixture And we put it in a tank, and the tank was exactly, um, let's say, negative 190 degrees Celsius. Okay. Well, what's going to happen if the tank's negative 190 degrees Celsius? Well, nitrogen boils at negative 195, so we're above the boiling point of nitrogen. So chances are nitrogen is going to boil off as a vapor. Okay, but oxygen doesn't boil until negative 183, so we're below the boiling point of oxygen, so oxygen's going to be left as a liquid. So we can separate them based on their boiling points. Now, um, I don't want to lie to you and say that it's actually that easy. Um, this is what we call distillation, and really... Um, doing this in one step isn't going to give you uh, that pure of... Um, substances because remember we talked about volatility things can break into the gas phase even below their boiling point just like water boiling or water evaporating in a puddle so not all so some of the oxygen even at negative 190 is going to break into the vapor phase and so you'll still have a mixture but if you did this over and over and over again in multiple stages um, then uh, you could get separation pretty good so um and just as a side note, if you've ever like driven and seen like a refinery or a big chemical plant on the side of the freeway or something, um, you'll see big distillation columns. They're like a couple hundred feet tall and um, they just look like big towers. And really what they have is they have within them multiple stages. And w so where it's doing this um, again and again and again and again and again. So you have your feed and you'll have actually much more pure things because they'll go through this process. Uh, a few dozen times. Anyway, just a side note. That's how we separate mixtures of, that's, that's about 90% of the separations of, of chemicals is through distillation like this. All right. Petroleum crude oil is a complex mixture of mostly hydro hydrocarbons that can be separated into useful fuels by distillation. Oh, we just talked about. In order of increasing boiling point, gasoline, jet fuel, kerosene, fuel oil, and diesel oil are all petroleum-based fuels. So we're saying gasoline's the lowest boiling point, uh, diesel oil is the highest boiling point. Based on that information, which fuel contains hydrocarbons that have the highest average molar mass? All right, so these are all hydrocarbons. They're all just C something, H something. Okay, and if you just have C something, H something, what's the intermolecular force you feel? London dispersion, because those are nonpolar molecules. So they're all London dispersion, which means that. Um, bigger size equals stronger intermolecular forces, okay, which equals a larger boiling point, which is what we're talking about in this problem. So we know diesel has the highest boiling point. Well, that means it has the strongest intermolecular forces, and because these are all London dispersion, that means it also has the biggest size. Um, and so which would you expect to have the highest molar mass? Diesel.
K. And then it asks, which would you predict to be the most viscous at 20 degrees Celsius? Well, what does intermolecular forces have to do with viscosity? Higher intermolecular forces equals higher viscosity. Okay, and so as a result, just move that into this problem. Um, as a result, we would also expect diesel oil to have the highest viscosity. Uh, they say at 20 degrees Celsius, it doesn't really matter. It's just that if I have two things, the one's at 20 degrees Celsius and the other's at 90 degrees Celsius, um, higher temperature is going to um, reduce your viscosity. Um, and so that's why if they're all at the same temperature, then you can just look at intermolecular forces. All right, the four constitutional isomers of heptane are shown below, which has the highest boiling point. Okay, so... Again, highest boiling point means highest intermolecular forces. So we got to ask our question, which has the highest intermolecular forces? Well, what are the types of intermolecular forces they feel? These blacks are carbons and whites are hydrogens, so these are all just hydrocarbons. They're all C6H, uh, not 12, 14. Um, so if they're just hydrocarbons, what's their dominant intermolecular force? London dispersion, which means your intermolecular forces are based on the size. Well, they're all C6H14. So their size, so first we look at stronger size. Their size is all the same because they're all this, they're isomers of each other. So size doesn't tell the story. So after size, we look at flatness. Okay, because the more flat you are, the more stackable you can get and the easier it is to induce dipoles into neighboring molecules. So it's pretty easy. This one is definitely the flattest. Okay, so this is going to have strongest intermolecular forces. And then this one has, looks like, one branch coming off, so that's next. This thing's got two branches coming off, so that's next. And this thing has three branches coming off, so that's next. Okay, well, they want highest boiling point, so they want highest intermolecular forces, which means most flat, since the sides are all the same. And which would be most viscous? Um, this is the same deal as the last one, right? Um, stronger intermolecular forces means most viscous, and so A is also most viscous. So it gets two circles. Okay, let's keep going. Water has some remarkable properties. Using your knowledge of intermolecular interactions, explain the following observations. Icebergs float instead of sinking. What does this mean? This means that the solid water is less dense than the liquid water which is not true for most molecules. And we'll talk about this more on the phase diagrams in problem set 28. Um, but water has, makes hydrogen bonds, and because of its unique bent shape, when it freezes, things want to maximize intermolecular forces when they freeze. And when water maximizes its hydrogen bonding, it actually ends up making... I don't even think I can draw it well. Nope, I can't draw it well. It makes these kind of hexagonal shape... Okay, which is less dense than the liquid where all the molecules are just kind of rolling over each other. It's why snowflakes form in, hexagon th in hexagonal um, kind of designs. But anyway, so, um, so really hydrogen bonding and its shape make the, uh, s the liquid more dense than the solid. Um, essentially what that means is when water freezes, it expands. That's kind of what that means. And so you have, you've probably seen this if you've like had a water bottle and you put it in the freezer. Um, sometimes if it's like a cheap plastic water bottle, the bottom of that water bottle will kind of get pushed out because water expands when it freezes. All right, the plumbing in a house may burst if the temperature in the house drops below zero degrees. All right, so what does that mean? Really, it's the exact same idea. Water expands when it freezes. All right, trees drink water, moving it from the ground to leaves in the air without muscles or movement of any kind. Okay, so this goes to a new idea that we haven't talked about yet called capillary action. The idea that if I put a tiny tube in water, okay, so I just dipped it in the water, okay, what I get is this behavior. 
Okay, the, the water gets sucked up the tube. And you've seen this, have you ever, if you've ever gotten like a blood prick on your finger, sometimes they will use a capillary tube and just they'll just touch the, the tube on the blood and the blood seems like it sucks up the tube. Well, that's just because of hydrogen bonding. So basically what this means, this glass is polar and so the water molecules um, that it got dipped into, I should draw this bigger, make it. The water molecules that um, are also polar, they get attracted to the sides of the glass and they kind of pull themselves up. And meanwhile, they are also pulling other water molecules up. So this is how trees drink. It's how they get water up to the top of the trees because they're full of tiny little tubes. And um, water can get sucked up those tubes because they're so thin. Uh, there's not a lot of gravity pulling the water down, but there is hydrogen bonding pulling the water up. So I'm just going to label this. This is called um, capillary action. And specifically, this is called adhesion. Wow, adhesion. Okay, adhesion is when things stick to different sub surfaces. So this water sticking to the glass, that's adhesion. Um, we'll talk about the opposite a little further down. Careful needle uh, can float on water but sinks in methanol because water has hydrogen bonding, which gives it strong surface tension but then a hot needle will sink but a cold needle floats that's because a hot needle has the energy to break um, to break the hydrogen bonds breaks the hydrogen bonds which allows the surface tension to break um, So then the hot needle will sink. All right, using your knowledge of intermolecular interactions, explain the following. We're almost done here. The height of liquid inside a very skinny straw is higher than the level of the drink in the cup in which it is sitting. Okay, so we already talked about that. Literally the exact same thing. Capillary reaction and um, adhesion. If the same skinny straw was placed in a dish of mercury, the height of the mercury in the straw would be lower than the level of mercury. Okay, so that, what they're describing is this. If this was mercury out here, you would get this behavior, the opposite behavior. Okay, so in this case, this is when cohesion dominates. In other words, cohesion is sticking to yourself. So in this case, the mercury, because mercury is nonpolar, is not attracted to the, to the straw, and as a result, that mercury... Um, is m would more like li wow uh, is more attracted to itself and so you see it kind of uh, bending down to hold on to itself instead of holding on to the wall of the straw so that's that's when cohesion dominates versus this is when adhesion dominates so adhesion is sticking to other things think of it like adhesive bandages stick to your skin and cohesion is sticking to yourself think co community self whatever okay the meniscus of the mercury in a mercury thermometer is convex, whereas the meniscus in the alcohol in an alcohol thermometer is concave. So that's exactly what we're talking about. Okay, so this is convex. This is concave. Um, so mercury is nonpolar, and alcohol is um, hydrogen bonding. And so if your glass thermometer is polar, the alcohol is going to be attracted to it, the mercury is not. It's harder to drink eggnog, non-alcoholic, of course, through a straw than water. Why? Uh, think thickness, right? Eggnog is really thick, so it's more viscous. So it's going to be harder to pull it up the tube. There's probably also... Um, and then water is less viscous. Also... Um, yeah, that's what I would think. I would just think viscosity. Uh, because eggnog will have a bunch of molecules in there that is probably going to have hydrogen bonding. It's probably also going to have a lot of lunch dispersion and stuff in there versus water just has hydrogen bonding. Or it's hydrogen, or it's lunch dispersion isn't very strong because it's so weak, small. Anyway, so that's kind of um, this problem set about applications of intermolecular forces. I hope what you just take away from this is whenever we ask you questions about these properties of molecules, we're really just asking you questions about intermolecular forces. And the first step is to figure out, okay, how does 
how does my intermarket forces relate to that property? 